So I showed you how to use the random forest classifier to predict cell identity. I showed you how to extract feature importance, tell you which genes were most important for those predictions. And then we also use the random forest model to differentiate between infected patients versus non-infected patients. For this machine learning series, I wanted to start off with random forest because it's relatively powerful and it's extremely easy to use. So we're going to start by loading in our modules that we'll be using, Pandas, ScanP, and sklearn. So you'll need to install those if you don't already have them. And then the data I'm using are lung data from a SARS-CoV-2 study where they had infected lethal COVID and healthy individuals. Don't worry about all this. Basically, I had two different files and I just took the annotations from my process file and put it on the raw data. So this A data hasn't been processed, but I added the UMAP just so we can visualize it. And I added the cell type annotations. So I've already removed all the cells that are doublets and did some other pre-processing on a cell level. You'd probably want to do that too before doing any of this. but. This is the raw gene matrix and I haven't filtered any genes. So I'm going to filter out any genes that aren't in at least 100 cells. I'm going to normalize every cell to 10,000 counts and then just convert them to log scale. It's important to point out that in the normalization we've done so far, all the cells are normalized independent of each other. Any normalization that you do that is dependent on other cells, you want to split the test and the train data before you do that type of normalization. And I'm going to do a couple examples in this first toy example. I'm just going to classify endothelial cells just to give you a quick, simple example of running the random forest model and then also show how we can extract feature importance, which is another one of the strengths of the random forest. It's not a complete black box. So I'm going to start with a simple little function. It's just going to return one if the cell label is an endothelial cell and it's going to return zero if it's not an endothelial cell. Let me just show you here that we're going to pass the cell type column to this function here. So we're going to create a list of ones and zeros and call it Y, and that will be the known label. So yes or no if it's an endothelial cell. Oh, Got to run this first. And then we can initialize the random forest classifier. I'm not going to change much from the default settings and estimators equals 100. So how many trees is equal to 100? That's default. So the only thing I'm going to change is the end jobs because we have a bunch of cells. So this is just going to run it with 10 different threads in parallel. So it's a little quicker. And then after we initialize it, we can just do a fit and we're going to be passing a data.x, which is just a matrix of cells by genes and then our y which again is just a zero or a one and note here i haven't split any train or test data because i'm just looking at the feature importance here so with 10 threads it only takes a few seconds so if we do our model dot feature importances with an underscore at the end you can actually get an array of feature importances which corresponds to our a data dot var names because a data dot var names is in the same order as the columns in our a data dot x so these are just our genes so we can combine the two in a pandas data frame so the feature importances and then set the index as our var names and then I'm just going to sort a column of importances just to show the most important on top. So here are top five most important genes that differentiated between the labels. So let's just graph this first one. And you can see that the expression of this most important feature corresponds well to our endothelial cell cluster. And then just for fun, I'm going to do a prediction based on the adata.x. This is a very biased prediction because it's the same data that we trained on, but I just want to show you what this would look like. So A is an array of zero or one. So is it an endothelial cell or is it not? And then if we add that to a new column in the observations of our A data, just so we can plot this and scan P. 
And again, we see that this corresponded very well to our endothelial cell cluster. But the main purpose again here was just to show you that random forest isn't just a complete black box. We can extract these features. And in this toy example, I'm expecting these most important features to correspond well to endothelial cell cluster markers. But let's get into some actual case examples. All right, so let's actually use it to classify cells. Again, remember we had several different cell types. I'm going to train a model on the endothelial cells and the aerocytes, which are similar to endothelial cells, to label endothelial cells in a completely different data set. Obviously, I'm just using cell identity as kind of a toy example. My last example, I'm going to differentiate between infected and non-infected cells. So again, I've already filtered and normalized, so I'm not going to do that again. But now, since we're doing an actual classification, we want to do it properly. So if we look at endothelial cells and aerocytes, we see that it's only 6,000 out of those 90,000 cells. So there's a big disparity. When you're doing classification, you don't want a big training disparity. So we're going to make an equal size data set that has labeled endothelial cells and the same number of other cells. So I'm just going to get the length of this and call that num. So we have 6,714. So we can use the same filtering we did here, but if we add a tilde right here, we get all the cells that aren't endothelial cells or aerocytes. And if we do obs.index, we get barcodes, but still 92,000 barcodes. So earlier we imported random. So we can do random.choices. We're gonna pass this list of barcodes. And then we're going to pass a value for k, which is how many to randomly choose, which is going to equal num. So we're going to do barcodes equals this. And if we look at the length of barcodes, we have 6714, which is equal to the number of endothelial cells. And then we're just going to combine those two sets of barcodes. So the endothelial cells, their barcodes to list. And since this is a list, we can just add them together and let's just make a new barcodes here I have to pass obs for the observation data frame instead of just the a data but if we look at barcodes now we have twice this number so 6700 endothelial cells and 6700 other cells and then to make our training data set we're just going to take this list of barcodes and pass it to a data to subset it based on those barcodes and now we have our training data set with 13,000 cells. Let's train a model on this training data set and then use it to predict endothelial cells in another data set. So for my test data set, I'm going to be using Tabula Sapiens and they have some lung data in there. So after downloading that, I can just open it straight up in scan P. 35,000 cells, 58,000 genes. So right now the genes are different in our training and test data sets and they're in a different order. So let's just harmonize those. So I'm gonna make a new ScanP object by concatenating our train and test. And by default, concat takes only the intersection of genes. So we have 19,000 genes. And if we wanted to filter down the number of genes, we could do something like highly variable genes to get the top 2,000 instead of having 19,000 features. Depending on how many samples in your data set, this might make it a lot more accurate or it might not change it much. Depending on the model, it's not always great to have many more features than you have samples. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run it. And if we look at var names now, we have 2,000 genes. And I'm just gonna get the var names from var names. So it's just gonna be a list of the genes. And then we can pass var names to both our test and train data sets to subset them and reorder the genes based on the order of our names. So now if we look at test, we have our 35,000 cells and 2,000 genes and our train with that 50-50 mixture of endothelial cells and other cells and 2,000 genes. And again, if we look at train obs, we have our cell type column. Predictions is just left over from what we did before. But our cell types with some endothelial cells and aerocytes, those are the ones we're going to want to label one. So I'm just going to make a new function called label train, which will label endothelial aerocytes with one and everything else is zero. We're going to make a new Y and we're going to pass that cell type column from train to this label train function. 
then we can train the random force classifier just like before we have fewer cells so it's quicker i'm not passing number of jobs but we still could and this time i'm passing train.x and then the new y we just made so now we have our trained random force classifier and we can use it on our test data by passing test.x to get a list of predictions and then I'm just going to add those predictions onto a new column in the test observation data frame. So I should have pointed out a second ago, but I forgot the test data. So the tabla sinus has been normalized and converted to log counts already, which is exactly what we did with our training data set. So you need to make sure that they're actually processed in the same way, but independently of each other. But anyway, if we look at test.obs now, we have our prediction column and the cells also came annotated with the cell ontology class. So we can actually get the ground truth to test the accuracy, which of course is a good thing to do to see how our model actually did. So I'm just going to pass cell ontology class to a function called label test, and they have their endothelial cells subset into a few different subpopulations. So I'm going to label all these different types of endothelial cells one and everything else is zero. And then I'm going to put that as a new column called labels. And then we can use that metrics module we imported earlier to do an accuracy score where we're passing our actual labels ones or zeros. And then we're passing our predicted labels ones or zeros. And we got about a 95% accuracy. So pretty good. I'm sure we could bump it up if we played around with the number of genes to actually include, etc. We could probably bump up the accuracy a couple percent playing around with the settings of the actual random forest model. But let's actually plot these. So I'm just passing the labels and predictions. That's why I added them to the data set. So you can see that they correspond pretty well. Best case scenario, you would have a few different data sets in your training data set. We used only one. But to use one data set that was actually processed with a different technology to label this data set from Tabula Sapiens, it actually worked pretty well. And I'm sure if we did a slightly fancier normalization, like with SCVI or did some scaling or et cetera, we probably could have bumped up the accuracy a little more too. But again, process the test and train the same, but independently of each other, or you'll get an artificial increase in accuracy. So for our final example, I thought it would be cool to try to differentiate between cells from infected patients and non-infected patients. And like I said, this data set is a mix of the two. So for this, since COVID impacts the epithelium greatly, I'm just going to pick AT2 cells. We could do it with any cell type though. So I'm going to make a new subset of AT2. I'm going to remove the genes that aren't present in at least 100 cells and then do the highly variable features. In this data set, we have, I think, around 30 different samples from 30 different individuals. So I'm going to split the test and train based on sample. So I'm going to take one COVID infected sample and one control sample for the test. So I'm going to take all the cells for the test that are from these two samples. And then for the train, I'm going to take all the cells that aren't from those two samples by using this tilde. So we have our train with 9,000 cells and our test with 1,100 cells. I'm going to make a slightly different labeling function this time. I'm going to label if they're COVID positive samples or if they're control samples. And you see the samples are just differentiated by if they have COV for COVID or CTR for control. So for this function, I'm just going to call it label infection. So I'm going to pass the sample column. If COV is in the sample name, I'm going to return one. So if it's control, it'll get zero. I'm going to use this function to label train. So I'm passing the sample column again and this function we just made. And then we can train the model just like we did before, initializing the classifier, passing train.x and our y labels. And then after we train the model, we're going to pass our test.x to predictions. So we're going to get the ground truth labels by using this label infection. So the actual labels or test. And then we can use this metrics accuracy score with our labels and then our predictions. And we have a 98, almost 99% accuracy. So really high. So we did a really good job just using this very simple default random force classifier to differentiate between the same cell type, but whether it came from an infected or non-infected patient. And like I did in the beginning, if we use the feature importance from our classifier, 
Oops, I gotta change this to train. So if we look at that, these top genes are gonna be the ones that are the most important for that classification. So AGBL1 strongly differentiates infected from non-infected cells. So I showed you how to use the random forest classifier to predict cell identity in completely different data sets. I showed you how to extract feature importance from the model, tell you which genes were most important for those predictions. And then we also use the random forest model to differentiate between cells from infected patients versus non-infected patients with an accuracy of almost 99%.